You are listening to Shanghai Spies, research written and narrated by Mark Felton. Episode two. The tramp of army boots marching in unison up Nanking Road, Shanghai's main shopping street, matched the eerie squealing and grinding of tank tracks. From the river, the last explosions died away as the British gunboat HMS Petrel, the last Royal Navy vessel in Shanghai, lazily rolled over and sank, steam hissing from the water as her burning superstructure went under, following her valiant but futile last stand against the might of the Imperial Japanese Navy. For those interested in pursuing this story further, I've made a video about HMS Petrel's last stand on my other channel, Mark Felton Productions. Link at the end of this video. Within the hour, the Union Jack was being hauled down from the tower of the Customs House, and the rising sun ran up the flagpole. The British and Allied nationals huddled inside their houses and apartments in disbelief. As short Japanese soldiers, bayonets fixed to rifles that were almost as tall as their owners, started to take over businesses throughout the settlement. Almost the only white people on the streets were Russian refugees and Germans, eagerly sporting swastika armbands, so as not to be confused with Japan's real Caucasian enemies. Behind the soldiers came the Kempei Tai military police, clutching lists of enemy aliens who should be investigated, arrested. Executed. Special Operations Executive had made a ghastly mistake in organizing OM Shanghai. All of its members were among the group the Japanese were most likely to intern early on during the occupation, the British ruling class. William Gand knew that it was only a matter of time before he was hauled in for questioning. For he and the other six members of OM Shanghai, a terrible period of uncertainty followed. None felt able to withstand what would be a very unpleasant time in Japanese hands, but there was no way out of the city, and any attempt to run would have signalled guilt more strongly than simply staying put and hoping for the best. The methods employed by the Kempei Tai to obtain information and confessions were brutally efficient and simple. The Japanese assumed that any answer, initially to a question, was a lie. And all interviewees were subjected to a beating, usually with a bamboo cane or a wooden club, that was designed to loosen the tongue. Questioning usually lasted several days, in some cases weeks and months, and beatings were interspersed with being hung from the ceiling by the thumbs, electric shocks being applied to the genitals, lit cigarettes mashed into yielding skin or thrust up nostrils, to the most dreaded torture of all. The water treatment. The subject was strapped down and a hosepipe forced into the mouth. Water was then pumped into the victim until drowning commenced and consciousness was lost. The questioner jumped on the victim's stomach or kicked the victim savagely and then evacuated the water. More questions would then be followed by more water treatment. Many men and women died under this sort of abuse. The first member of OM Shanghai who was arrested by the Kempei Tai was surprisingly not Gand, but the former senior policeman William Clark on the 17th of December 1941. Clark was taken to the Kempei Tai headquarters at Bridge House, located just across Garden Bridge at the north end of the Bund, and was tortured by Lieutenant Yamamoto and his men. American journalist John B. Powell, who shared a cell with Clark, said that Clark was unable to stand. Clark said to Powell that he believed that he was going to die, and the two men prayed together and waited for the end. It is believed that Clark cracked under torture and named some of the members of OM Shanghai. This would hardly have been surprising, as Clark and the others had received absolutely no training in withstanding interrogation. According to Powell, Clark was pushed into the corner alongside me, and I saw he was in severe pain. He was suffering from several boils on his neck. They had become so infected and swollen because of lack of medical attention that his head was pressed over against his shoulder. However, Powell's representations to Yamamoto regarding Clark's pitiful condition caused the Japanese to remove Clark to hospital. 
The treatment he received saved his life. Powell was not so lucky. On the 27th of December, Yamamoto and his men struck again, this time arresting Gand, Brister and Jack. They were bundled at gunpoint into three cars and driven to Bridge House. The three SOE agents were extensively tortured until more names were forthcoming, then were thrown into overcrowded rat-infested cells and denied medical attention. Under constant torture and dreadful sanitary conditions, William Gann developed infected toenails, among other things. A Japanese medical officer tore Gann's toenails off with a pair of pliers, without administering any anaesthetic. The treatment dished out to Gand, Brister and Jack completely exposed the entire OM network in Shanghai and would lead to the arrest of the three final men, John Brand, Sidney Riggs and Edward Elias. The Japanese had compelling evidence, telegrams between Gand and OM HQ in Singapore, phone tap records, references to the Ministry of Economic Warfare in London and the evidence for torture. The arrested agents did not think that they would survive. The Kempei Tai made sure that conditions inside Bridge House were as unpleasant as possible. Aside from fearsome interrogations, rats and disease-infested lice were everywhere, and no one was allowed to bathe or shower, so diseases from dysentery to typhus to leprosy ran rampant. Many British and American journalists were swept up by the Kempei Tai and extensively ill-treated, largely because they had had the temerity to publish articles condemning Japanese atrocities in China. The experience of John B. Powell was typical. According to the North China Daily News reporter Ralph Shaw, the Kempei Tai torturers wreaked their vengeance on the brave American Powell and subjected him to atrocious assaults, beating him unmercifully. These beatings included kicking, usually in the genital region, beating, anything connected with physical suffering. Powell was the editor of the China Weekly Review, and he was imprisoned and tortured alongside fellow American Victor Keane of the New York Herald Tribune. When the questioning began, they had to remove all their clothing and kneel before their captors. When their answers failed to satisfy their interrogators, the victims were beaten on the back and legs with four-foot bamboo sticks until blood flowed. John Powell was left crippled. He was a permanent invalid and was later shipped home to the United States aboard a repatriation vessel. Gangrene set in and Powell had part of a leg amputated. He never recovered and died shortly after. A British journalist named Healy, who ran the XMHA radio station, was subjected to treatment which plumbed the depths of human depravity, according to his friend Ralph Shaw. He went insane and died bloodied and crippled in his rat hole of a cell in the bridge house. The greatest prize for the Japanese was a British writer and journalist named H.G.W. Woodhead, editor of Oriental Affairs and weekly columnist on the Shanghai Evening Post and Mercury, who had spent years denouncing Japanese militarism in China. Woodhead had also broadcast twice weekly a strong anti-Japanese message on Shanghai's XMHC and XCDN radio stations at the direct behest of the British government. On the 5th of December 1941, just days before Pearl Harbor, the British Embassy had advised Woodhead to get out of Shanghai as fast as possible, and the frightened journalist had booked passage on a Panamanian ship scheduled to sail four days later. This delay meant that Woodhead was still in Shanghai on the 8th of December. He took refuge in a friend's house in the French concession, but eventually emerged and registered as an enemy alien, as all British, American, Free French, Dutch, Norwegian, Greek and other nationals were required to do so by the Japanese. London was becoming concerned, for Oriental Mission Shanghai appeared to have dropped off the face of the earth. Nothing was heard from them. SOE dispatched a Chinese agent, codenamed Dr. Chang, to Shanghai on the 21st of April 1942 in an effort to find out what had become of them. SOE was still in operation in the rest of China and, unlike OM, had sensibly utilized local Chinese as agents. 
Chang managed to discover at great risk that Gand and the others, minus Clark, who was in hospital, were being held in terrible conditions at Bridge House. This information came from Hugh Collar, local head of ICI, or Imperial Chemical Industries, and pre-war friend and colleague of Valentine Killery, who had been running SOE operations in the Far East. Chang visited several other British businessmen in Shanghai, but they were all afraid and most realised that they were probably under Kempe Tai surveillance. Chang was not able to contact Gan's group in prison, and he returned to Kunming in Free China on the 11th of September to report to London. By this stage, London had been told of the fate of OM Shanghai, which had been reported in the Shanghai press in June. By early 1942, the Kempei Tai appeared to have been satisfied that it had captured all of the members of the British sabotage group. The Japanese decided that a prosecution would be made against the men, and that this should have at least the veneer of legality. For the members of OM Shanghai, who fully expected to have their heads cut off any day, the sudden news of a trial at least offered a reprieve from any more torture, and perhaps even survival for some of their number. For several weeks, Gand and his compatriots had lived a terrifying existence marked by brutality and horrific living conditions, during which the men had become emaciated through lack of food, were covered in cuts and bruises from the ill-treatment they had suffered, and sported straggly beards and unkempt hair full of lice. These men had had a glimpse of hell, but with a sudden jerk they were ordered out of Bridge House by the Kempei Tai. As each man left, the Japanese forced them to sign a document stating that they had been reasonably treated and were in good health, the Japanese being almost as pedantic record keepers as the Nazis. Loaded aboard a truck, they were driven to Kyungwan and pushed into fresh cells. Kyungwan is about 10 miles from Shanghai and in 1942 was the headquarters of the Japanese 15th Army. At this point, the Japanese held off on any further ill-treatment. The men's wives were permitted to send in food parcels, which the Japanese pilfered before handing over. Clark appears to have been overlooked by the Kempei Tai and was left in a hospital in Shanghai, recuperating from his experiences of torture. William Gan's health was rapidly deteriorating at Kyungwan when it was announced that all six men would be placed on trial before a military tribunal on the 28th of April 1942, charged with having operated a secret organization whose activities were detrimental to the interests of Japan and to local law and order. The Kempei Tai charge did not mention SOE or OM explicitly, probably indicating that the Japanese never fully understood the full significance of the group. The trial was a mockery. Gan received the harsher sentence, four years' imprisonment, while the rest received lesser terms. The sentences were to be served at Ward Road Jail in Shanghai. Thankfully, this large modern prison was run by the Shanghai Municipal Police and not by the Japanese. Strangely, some of the British prison warders had been permitted by the Japanese to continue in their duties. Britons ended up guarding Britons. These brave prison warders risked severe punishments by passing messages to and fro between the OM Shanghai members and their families, as well as getting them extra food and cigarettes. The Japanese eventually interned all of the warders when they decided to remove all enemy aliens from posts throughout the city. In the autumn of 1942, Riggs, Brister, Jack and Brand were suddenly freed and bundled aboard a repatriation ship bound for Lorenco Marquez in Mozambique, part of an exchange of Allied personnel for Japanese who had been interned in Britain. Riggs was to write a report exposing exactly what had happened to OM Shanghai that ruffled many feathers in Whitehall. The Riggs report, as it has become known, did not make for happy reading in London. The report was believed to be so damaging to the reputation of SOE, already quite self-conscious in front of the established intelligence organisations, that the version released to the Foreign Office was considerably watered down. Lord Selborne, 
the minister responsible for the SOE called it ghastly to read, restrained and vivid. Questions were naturally asked, for example, why were a group of men with no training and little practical support permitted to represent SOE in Shanghai? And what did they achieve other than their own capture and imprisonment? Valentine Killery was criticised for permitting such a foolish venture to occur in the first place, along with several other highly placed officials. MI6 was not overly upset at the swift demise of OM Shanghai, an organisation that could have exposed all British intelligence operations in the city. Suspicions have continued that MI6 may have had a hand in the destruction of OM Shanghai. All of this was not helped by the fact that it was obvious that the Japanese had an agent close to OM Shanghai virtually from the beginning. The whole episode was incredibly embarrassing for SOE, and they were determined to bury the fiasco as fast as possible. Riggs, Brister, Jack and Bran were free, but Gand, Elias and Clark remained in Japanese hands. In October 1943, Edward Elias was suddenly released from Ward Road Jail. His subsequent activities in occupied Shanghai have generated a great deal of suspicion since the war. He set himself up as a freelance spy. It seems he was also a double agent by this time, trying to recruit young foreigners into his organisation with the intention of betraying them to the Japanese. Elias was named several times as a Japanese spy, which might have some bearing on the earlier arrest and imprisonment of OM Shanghai. When William Clark was released at the end of 1942, he too chose to remain in Shanghai. He could have sought repatriation as he was above military age and had suffered considerable ill health as a result of his association with OM Shanghai. Nevertheless, he stayed put. Perhaps he stayed because his wife was Indian, and therefore socially unacceptable in Britain at the time. Or perhaps he had cracked under Kempe Tai torture and feared that he would be punished if he returned to Britain. There is also the tantalising possibility that Clark had been an MI6 agent and stayed in Shanghai to continue working for military intelligence. When I requested the SOE personnel files at Q, only Clark's was still classified for 77 years. Elias's file had only been declassified in 2007. SOE learned a valuable lesson from the OM Shanghai debacle, one that impinged directly upon further operations in China. Gifted amateurs were always welcome in SOE, but never again would a team be left to its own devices and then completely abandoned at the critical hour. Much bitterness and recrimination was generated by the affair, especially when SOE tried to downplay the embarrassing events it had created in Shanghai. SOE was quick to rebuild its operations in occupied and free China, working closely with the American Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, and with the corrupt Chinese nationalist regime of Chiang Kai-shek, whom the Americans referred to as Cash Mai Chek. Some great successes were achieved later in the war using Chinese personnel as agents, though operational control remained in the hands of the British in India. The contribution to the ultimate defeat of Japan was significant. One of the best examples of a patriotic Englishman with SOE in China was Walter Fletcher, a larger-than-life character who managed to create a massive smuggling network in occupied China through his close relationship with Chinese criminal gangs. Through smuggling and currency speculation, this one man managed to raise the staggering sum of £77 million for SOE. This made Oriental Mission financially independent for the rest of the war and allowed it to provide assistance to British internees when Japan was defeated, as well as a host of other legal and illegal projects. After the war, Lord Selborne was one of many British officials who had been appalled at the treatment handed out to William Gand and his group, and one of several who suggested an official apology and compensation be offered to the former SOE men. For example, Gand eventually was remitted £5,000 for his trouble and given a written apology. 
but it was not a public apology. SOE was not prepared to allow its reputation to suffer. The whole affair leaves one with a bad taste in the mouth and smacks of a payoff. As a stay-behind force, OM Shanghai was an unmitigated disaster. Probably more useful as a propaganda exercise, the negligible results of OM Shanghai's operations negated this value as well. But the men deserve better than to be left untrained, compromised by the recruitment into an organization the Japanese wanted to smash, and then cynically abandoned to their fates when the British position in Asia unraveled in the face of the Japanese onslaught. OM Shanghai represents the ugly side of an otherwise glorious SOE history, which perhaps explains why it is hardly ever mentioned in the histories of that organization, and why several of its files remain top secret seven decades after the end of the war. You have been listening to Shanghai Spies, research written and narrated by Mark Felton. For a host of short videos on a wide variety of military history topics, visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.